Permaculture is my passion. Hello, hello, hello. Episode 127 of the Permaculture Pimpcast, where pimp stands for permaculture is my passion. The only pimpcast on planet Earth where we discuss permaculture, preparedness, practical living, and sometimes the paranormal. How you doing, son? Pretty good. How are you? Yeah, it is sometimes a paranormal. <laughs> yeah, so in lieu of a Wednesday program, we got a little bit of announcement here. We're going to have... In lieu uh, of a Thursday uh, Wednesday. typical program. Yeah, so instead, well, we have a, usually a bonus on Wednesday. Right, an interview. Yeah, yeah an interview on Wednesday. We're just going to put that on Thursday because I'm going to be out of town, but I'll cover that in a minute. Because, as always, y'all, this episode brought to you by Hickory Ridge Soap from Two Old Crows Homestead.com. Turn that simp into a pimp. Bam! Also, Heaven's Harvest, y'all, 10% off with promo code PERMA. And I know a lot of people are out there buying that stuff right now. And I think it's a wise thing to do. In fact, we're going to cover a lot more of that as this program unfolds. But remember, 10% off with promo code PERMA. We're going to talk about some of the things you can do for yourself, but all those little gaps that you may not be able to fill, that's where you go to get it. Go check them out. You'll be glad you did. Also, if you'd like to tip a pimp, go check us out on the Fountain app where you can honestly tip a pimp in, in, well, not in the typical way, but you can use sats or, yeah, I'm not even going to pronounce that word because I mess it up every single time. Listen to all your podcasts over there, and to my understanding, I guess it's working again. How you doing, son? Good. Yeah, uh, Fountain App is working again. Um, I don't know what was going on. Apparently, they had an app update, and then after the update, it started working again on my phone. But some people were saying that it was working for them the whole time, and then others were saying it wasn't. But they were also saying it wasn't working on other platforms at the same time. Well, we also get a lot of weird anomalies that seem to happen with our program, like emails that people said they were sending, but I don't get them. I mean, I know they're not lying about it. And then there's other things like uh, the host for our podcast, supposed to be getting back to you. Apparently that's never happened either. Well, no, it did, but I had to reach back out to them in order to get uh, some sort of contact. Weird things, y'all, but that's what happens when you're over the target. You're going to suffer a little flack, but Jimmy crack corn, and I don't care. Jimmy could be smoking crack, and I still don't. Well, I do kind of care. Jimmy, don't smoke crack. (laughs) All right, so this is one of those auspicious days, um, September 11th. So what's your earliest earliest recollection of that date? Um, I... I vaguely remember seeing something on TV when I got home, but the more memorable part was the next day at school. They, I remember the teacher asked, like going around and asking what everybody thought happened. And then that just seemed bizarre to me, but also everybody had a different answer for what they thought happened. And none of it, none of the answers were, a plane just flew into the side of a building. That's that's the most memorable part, was that everybody's answer was different, but none of them were the plane flew into the side of a building. Wow. Yeah, it's one of those weird things. It's one of those weird dates, but it also inspires a little bit of a preparedness angle on this program. Because honestly, I remember not long after that, you couldn't, I was one of those people. I bought it hook, line, and sinker like everybody else. Now, the strange thing is, and we kind of talked about it before, how you can be completely out of the matrix regarding one thing, but completely a chained at the bottom of Plato's cave regarding another. Yeah. So like everybody else, you know, I was, well, let me back up because I had already been doing a deep dive into like things like the Kennedy assassination. And prior to that, you know, things like World War One, World War Two. Vietnam, all these other things where I was into occulted or hidden history, even the Civil War, I mean, you name it. I was always interested in those things, but I sat there like a complete lemming because, you know, having been a soldier and not long out of the Army when all that happened, I was about ready to raise my hand and go sign up again just because that happened. And I know a lot of other guys that did. So they got out, turned back around, went right back in, and had circumstances been a little bit differently, you know, I, I wonder how long you it, from signing back up. Well, really, um, in a nutshell, it was a couple of things. Number one, you were still little and I'd already spent 
I remember the first time I came home after being on a deployment, coming back and you didn't know who I was. You were a baby. And that bothered me. That bothered me a lot. And I, I, I think at that time I was gone maybe six months and I was in Kuwait at that time. And I remember I came back, you didn't know who I was and that bothered me. But also the truth of it is I was still wallowing in self pity to a certain extent. And regarding all this baggage that you have growing up, I don't want to go sideways here, but there was a lot of demons I was battling, so to speak, concerning how I was raised and the, the horrors and all those other things. And I just didn't have my head. I was not at all the man I was that I am today. And in fact, I don't even think I'm the man I was even a year ago or five years ago. That's why the most offensive thing anybody can ever say to me is, you know, somebody you haven't seen in a while, the most offensive thing anybody could ever say to me is, and I quote, you haven't changed a bit because A, I know they're lying because I don't even recognize myself. But I know that's a long roundabout way. There's a lot more. It would take a whole program to unpack it all. Mm -hmm. But number one, I was trying, you know, you, you're in there and you have this identity and I was good. I was a very good soldier and I was very good at what I did, had the opportunity, the sun and moon thrown at me, honestly, um, when I was getting out, they were like making these overtures, you know, going to me and your mom saying, Hey, let, we want to make him an officer and all this other stuff. And turned all that, turned it all down because I was told another promise by a family member that turned out to be a lie. <laughs> yeah. Um, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise, but long story short, yeah, I was about to go back in and, um, it was, I think honestly, when I first came out of the matrix, believing what everybody else did, it was honestly the most agonizing, painful awakening I ever had in my life. Because I remember working at eight eleven Maine in downtown Kansas city. I was running a job there. And my apprentice, Jason, was there with me. And there was a guy in there handing out these DVDs of 9-11, some 9-11 documentary. And I remember Jason was about to put hands on him, and I was about to do it too, when he was making all these suggestions about what, what actually happened on 9-11. And I remember I took that DVD, put it in my lunchbox. That thing must have sat in there. I'll bet it sat in there six months the job had come and gone. I, I was on another job running another job in downtown Kansas city. And, um, I don't know whatever possessed me, but one night I threw that thing in the DVD player when I got back home and I'm sitting here watching things because I've never been a coincidence theorist. And then like with the JFK assassination, if you got to believe a whole lot of coincidences unfolded for you to buy the official story. And the same thing with, you know, so many other things in history that I can cite off the top of my head. I watched this thing and I remember it was going on probably, I don't know, one, maybe two in the morning. I remember being so infuriated that I was a freaking fool to ever having believed what should have been very, very obvious to me. And like so many others, you know, I, at, at that moment, it's like they say, like Tony from the confessionals always says, and it's something of a cliche that the truth will, you'll, how does it go? The truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Yeah. And that's yeah. exactly what it did to me. So I had this existential crisis trying to figure out, okay, man, okay, I'm, I'm not fully believing it. I don't want to believe it. I'm going to kid myself for a little while longer. Then I came across something else and then I came across something else. And then there were so many data points coming out at that time with all these people pointing out things this should have been very obvious to me. Number one, having the background that I did in the military, I should have been able to look at that building from the very outset and realize, okay, it ain't going to fall through the point of most resistance yeah. and it definitely ain't going to do it at free fall speed. So, and then I got or to, twice. <laughs> yes. No, three times. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that's what we know of. And so this was a really coming out of the matrix for me, but yeah, I was angry for a long, long time. And then I went out to change the world. So I got into talk radio and it ended up being, you know, the, the backup guy and the guy they brought in there to be incendiary in Kansas city radio for a while. And of course was hosting shows on my own, but, and then once again, the sun and moon was thrown at me, but I, I, I was, it was a bridge too far for them because I was not going to, unlike the other talk radio hosts, they got nothing else to do. Folks, I'm going to give you a little inside baseball here. When you hear a lot of these people on local talk radio, 
um, and I'm talking midsize or even large markets, they have no other marketable skills. Yeah. I mean that. I mean that. If they weren't doing radio at that time, and I'm talking every single radio host I knew, they had no plan B. But for me, it was a different thing. I was already a journeyman electrician. I was moonlighting as a talk show host and learning the craft, learning what to do, what not to do. Now it's totally different in podcast, but I was learning the ropes. And then all of a sudden they start telling you what you can and can't say. They love the fact that I was putting butts in seats. But then they were getting very, very irritated when all of a sudden I wanted to bring in Richard Gage from Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Yeah. There was a guy who they they scrubbed the show. They didn't even let me do it. Of a guy who worked for the, oh, shoot, who are those people that investigate plane crashes? Um, he was a oh, black box. Well, he was a black box, ex, the NTSB. He was a black box expert. And he was going to come in there. Well, they nixed that show. And then all of a sudden they're throwing the, they're wanting to throw the sun and moon at me, make all these different, but I, I had to not say certain things. And I'm like, okay, well, unlike the other people you have working here and I know them all, um, you don't own me. I got a plan B. In fact, my plan, a re- talk radio, local talk radio does not pay that much folks. I mean, really does not no. pay much at all. Yeah. They'll throw perks at you. Like you get to drive around maybe in one of the cars or whatever. I mean, they throw these little perks at you, but they're really not much. But that's why so many people are willing in the news media and talk radio and all these other things. That is so willing. Believe me, I could go on for hours and tell you stories about how corrupted these people are, even at the local level, even at the, the, the medium range, whatever they call it, the medium range radio stations where these people have local talk shows. They don't have a plan B. So that's why they will do whatever they are told. I saw it. I saw them scrub stories. I saw them lie about stories. I saw it all up close and personal. But going right back to 9-11, that's really when I saw the suppression right there and what I was being told every time I'd bring this up. I mean, they were tamping me down. And you couldn't even talk about it in good company. It was the same way Jim Mars, um, the guy who wrote Crossfire about the JFK assassination, yeah. the way he described that for 10 years solid after the Kennedy assassination, you couldn't even talk about it in good company. And it was almost the same way. It didn't last quite that long with uh, 9-11, but people were, were willing, and there are some still willing to believe the official story. Long story short, it was at that point, once I realized I was lied to, and then all of a sudden I became an activist in the most... I was already an activist, but for what I think was the right things, I discovered Ron Paul, discovered the Liberty Movement. The crazy thing about it was I already had all these thoughts and didn't even know people like Ron Paul even existed. Do you remember the uh, Tea Party Movement and all those rallies yeah. in Kansas? Yeah. I just, yeah, that just remembered. I was invited to all of them. a bunch of those memories for me. Yeah. I forgot about those. I was invited to all of them, but I wasn't a Republican, and I'm definitely not a Democrat. And so I would go to these tea party things and I'm like, okay, all sounds good. But all I'm seeing up here are Republicans. I mean, dad's disappointing both sides when he goes to rallies. Yeah. I mean, that's why that's, you know, I heard Joel Thomas and uh, Sean Chris the other day on kill the mockingbirds. It may have been a week ago, how they won't get invited because they they're to other podcasts because they're viewed as being too polarized. Well, the same exact thing happens with us where there are people out there that, they want to do an interview until they listen to what I just put out. Well, until not I just put out. Not picking a side is the most polarizing yes. thing you apparently can do. Well, or recognizing that it's all corrupt. Yeah, that it's all corrupt. That you don't have a, the only savior out there is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe any of the nonsense they're telling you, if you don't realize, it's just like that Carol Quigley, you know, Bill Clinton's mentor from Georgetown University. You know, the guy that. Um, that basically wrote that tell all book, which escapes me right now where he said, basically what we ought to be having, this was a book that was not intended for the public, but it made it out that what we need to have is a Democrat and a Republican party that are really the same thing, but we create the false illusion of choice, like Coke and Pepsi tied and cheer. You get the point. And that's exactly where we are right now. And no matter where you are, they're, they're leaning you up the ladder. I didn't mean to spend that much time on September 11th, but it did inspire what we're going to talk about in the main topic here. So as far as other farm news, well, I've been doing a lot of blueberry propagation. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and a whole lot. Now, folks, I've never done this before. Now, here's why I'm telling you why I'm doing this. 
I've done it so far, three different methods for propagating blueberries. Here's why. Okay, you can go out there to YouTube University and go learn this stuff. Here's the problem. This is one of those times, and I understand every understand everybody's frustration out there. You'll have one guy that says, this is the way to do it. You'll have 10 people out there, and no two of them are doing it the same way. Yeah. So should have probably made a video on this one, Dad. I, I probably still could because, in fact, I, I think I still want to because a lot of people, when you're new to this space or you're trying something new, let's say you've been farming and let's say you're just doing vegetable gardens, now you're going to go into the chicken realm. Well, this to you is going to be daunting, and it is to everybody else, so don't feel you know alone there. And you're going to bring these chickens on, and you're trying to find out how to what do you do when you get them home. And then you get all this conflicting information. You're just going to have to go out there and take that plunge. And that's exactly what I did. But what I did is one method. One guy is like, they all use rooting hormone to some extent or another. Yeah. Um, all but one guy. And one of them takes and puts them in sand. You want a neutral medium. And I understand that. So the blueberry cutting or the cane rather has enough energy in it to make it go. Well, another guy mixes it with coconut core, compost, and uh, sand. Or, and then another guy does something else. So I did three different methods out there. I have no idea which one's going to work. <laughs> I don't know if any of them are going to work, but this is what I'm hoping to find out. So I'm going to try all three methods when it's all said and done. I'm going to let everybody know which one worked out the best, but this is one of those cases where just like everybody else, I mean, people might fancy us as subject matter experts, but there's times out there where we have to go on a limb because I can't get straight answers on exactly how to do this. Did you label which one was which? Um, it's obvious. Okay. You can tell by the medium. Cool. You can, you can tell by the medium. What about which blueberry cuttings were which? No. Do you know which ones came from the yeah. that orchard up in Hendersonville? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, that's not actually Hendersonville, but yeah, I, it's close okay. enough. But yeah, I went out there, got some cuttings, uh, some softwood cuttings, and then later on in the winter, I'm going to get some hardwood cuttings. And we're going to try it every single, every conceivable way. But that's what I've been doing a lot of lately, doing a whole, propagating a whole lot of, a lot of blueberries, because I got news for you. Go out there and go buy these plants. Yep. See what they're charging. I mean, just this last year alone, I could not even believe what they were charging for. Now, this is the latest thing where they'll take a one-year-old plant, put it in a five-year-old pot, yeah. charge you the five-year-old price. Yeah, that's the kind of garbage that's going on right now. Yeah. So we'll cover more of that once again in, in the um, main topic. So, all right, other farm news. Um, part of the reason why we're going to have not the Wednesday show, but we're going to take the Wednesday show and put it on Friday is because uh, Michelle and I are going to basically hang out with Stevan Subkoviak up there in Canada. Now, I know there are people out there that wanted to do a link up or a meet up, but I'm not, I, there's a whole lot that's just unknown right now. Um, I know I'll be hanging out with him uh, late next week. And he's a very busy guy, so I'm just thankful he can carve out that time. And to me, this is like meeting the superhero. If there is a way, do you want to announce it somehow? Yeah, to do you'll, like a meetup? you'll have to let me know. I'm not quite sure how that would even happen or if anybody even in Canada even knows who we are. Well, there's a couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's quite a few people who want to meet up with you. Um, all right, so if there is a meetup, then I'll do a post on Instagram. So if you weren't following us, there's a reason to follow us now. It might be but an impromptu. Yeah. yeah, it'll be as soon as I know something, I'll do a post on Instagram. And then I'll probably do a couple posts leading up to it, depending on how far away it is. All right. So in the other farm news, we've been gathering. Well, I'm I'm starting to gather leaves because uh, we're going to really. OK, so the compost piles we've been doing out there are balling. Um, you did a assessment today, right? Well, I, that, I was going to say that was part of the farm news um i've been struggling to get this computer and microscope to work together so no the assessment didn't get done well anyway the last time it was assessed uh this this compost is fantastic but we're kicking it on to another level um we've had a lot of woody material and stuff in there and now that we're getting into fall depending on it's kind of feeling fallish so some of the leaves are coming off well, I'm going to, instead of using more woody material, I'm going to start using some of these leaves out here and we are going to kick up our compost to another level still. Um, William and I went out there and inoculated a couple of piles today and um, yeah, we're just trying to kick more fungus up in there. Can't have too much, you know, considering what we're dealing with in certain areas. So on another thing, I got a land acquisition idea that I came up with today. 
Folks, here's why you want to go out there and spend time talking to people. Okay, so I had to go to town today. There's a local college, and I stopped in. I'm making myself get out of my normal patterns. I had to go to the post office, drop off orders. I had to run to the bank, go do something. And then there's like this juice smoothie kind of place. I go over there and stop in. It's whack, but it's right on the college (laughs) campus. And I bought something, but it opened up an opportunity to talk to the people there, which happened to have like four students. And the students were there and also the owner of the shop. So it gave me a feel for the bottom as far as how business is in town, as far as what regulatory hurdles, what this, what that. And then it gave me an opportunity also to talk to the kids like, hey, where do you guys go to do your laundry? Because there is no laundry place around here. And then I'm asking, okay, what do y'all do in your time off? And they're like, there's nothing to do. We don't want to go to Asheville because it doesn't feel safe right now. And I'm like, wow, that's weird for college (laughs) kids. Also, they could probably beat up most people in Asheville. Yeah. They're pretty safe. (laughs) I will say, though, at this college, man, I have not yet met a marchy lunatic yet. Not yet. In fact, every kid that I was talking to, so I kind of had the audience of all of them as I'm in here buying this smoothie that was totally whack. I don't know what was in that thing, but it had me well, tripping. Also, our college interaction includes the gym and then also that smoothie protein place. So, of course, you're not going to see any Marchies, Dad. Well, yeah, I did <laughs> see a couple of fruit. Shop. I saw a couple of <laughs> fruitcakes inside shop. that gym in there. Man, I, it was like I was watching <laughs> Richard Simmons. <laughs> but, I mean, the cool thing, here's what I'm saying. Go out there and talk to as many people as you can because – I'm seeing an opportunity, even William doesn't even know about this, but I talked to your mom about it, about a potential land acquisition. I'll I'll just kind of spring the trap right now. As I'm in there talking to these kids, I'm finding out what's available. What do they do in their time off? What they would like to see. You know what I figured out just in that little conversation? What? If we had a food truck over at that college, we would make a fortune. We would make an absolute, I know so, because I'm sitting here talking to these girls that are, it was all girls in there. The shop owner is a woman and also the girls, the people that the students that were in there were also girls. And when you're trying to get a feel for the bottom, as far as what you can sell and whatever, the women are usually the best indicators Yeah. and guys, it's going to be a very myopic kind of view on those things. So as I'm sitting here talking to them, they're like, man, there's like this jacked up pizza place in town. The uh, brewery down the way has awful food. Yeah. And, you know, n- none of us have jobs. We can't, nobody, well, there's no jobs to be had around here. Everybody's fighting for the couple of jobs that do exist. And so I walked out of that place realizing, hey, that now they do have money to spend on lunch or whatever. That's about what they have. And I, I said, well, I saw a food truck down there. They're like, yeah, weird hours. They show up and then they don't show up. And I'm like, what about the cafeteria? And like, eh, you know. So the point of it being the, the, the core to all of this, and I'm going to encourage you guys out there to do the same thing before. I've worked with colleges in the past, taking their food scraps, the whole nine yards, been offered the sun and moon regarding a lot of this stuff. I said all that to say this. I walked out of that shop and my experience today realizing, A, if I, I could run a food truck over there and make a fortune yeah, as a captive audience, as long as I got decent food, B, I'm realizing there's a ton of land on this college campus that I could possibly use to make a demonstration site. There's a ton of land on there that I could use to do a lot of community good. Like I'm seeing old folks suffering inside these grocery stores. Okay, well, maybe, I don't know. I'm just saying there's a ton of opportunity here. So think about these off the beaten path things. Do you have a local school that maybe you might be able to put a food forest in? Could you grow some food there? Could you make it a demonstration site? Because the truth is, I'm trying to evangelize this design science and make it accessible. Because I can't just have every Tom, Dick, and Harry roll up on my property. Right. And I can't have it day or night. There's already people, you know, driving by and doing this and that. Yeah, there's already black vans showing up. Yeah. But we can't just have people. I mean, if every if we let everybody come to visit that asks, we would never get anything done. And that's really how it works. Even if somebody says, we're going to be there, we'll just stay for 15 minutes. It never works out that way. And number two... I, it, we just can't from, from a security standpoint, we just can't do it. So I'm thinking, okay, there's some other options here. So yeah, I know we're a little bit long in the tooth concerning this whole farm news, but yeah, there's some things there I wanted to cover. So just remember y'all October 7th farm where you live going to be in South Carolina. 
Joel, the pimp daddy of Polyface, is going to be there. Of course, that's he's the star of the show, if you ask me. And then they got a, bother, a bunch of others that are going to be there as well. So go check them out. they got a website. Also, coming up week after next, as soon as we get back from uh, Canada, it's going to be back to the land, September 22nd and through the 24th. Really awesome venue. You're going to wish you were there. We're going to be doing a book signing. Then not long after that, October 20th through the 22nd, Mountain Readiness. Go check that out. We're going to be there as well. And then, of course, Kentucky Sustainable Living. Got to get them on the show so we can talk about everything that's going to be happening there. That's going to be October 28th and 29th. So with that, y'all, we're going to go right into bad news, good news. So, um, yeah, y'all, we usually have a transition here. So if there was a little bit of a weird pause, you know why. All right, well, check this out, son. Here's the bad news. Oh, my goodness. Hawaii governor starts to give the game away, then struggles to unsay it. Well, what I'm really taking away from this article is that there is still 1,757 children that are missing. The fact that our so-called free press or press to toots, nobody's touching. Yeah. If you had 1,700 freaking kids missing, you think that would be newsworthy? Yeah. Yeah, you would... Well, Joe Rogan just did an interview with Tulsi Gabbard and BJ Penn. I wonder what they have to say about it. Because I know BJ Penn, didn't he just run for governor or something like he that? He ran for some political office, I Some believe. political office. I wonder if I wonder if he was I wonder what his reaction would have been, you know, having been come from Hawaii and all that stuff. I wonder what his reaction would have been to all of this. Well, yeah, BJ Penn was a former um what was UFC. It? Welter, UFC welterweight and lightweight champion. One, of, I think he was the second guy ever to do it. Incredible fighter for his time and um, extraordinary. Uh, you know, a prodigy. That, in fact, that was his name. Yeah, he was really a prodigy in all things fighting. So he's something of a, a star over there in Hawaii. And of course, you know who Tulsi Gabbard is. I don't know what they said. I don't know what was said. I know this much: seventeen hundred fifty-seven kids missing. Yeah, do you think it was just a – do you think they died in the fire or do you think it was like a, a smuggling operation? You know, I've heard I've heard that theory. Um, maybe a lot a lot of people haven't. Look, folks, we are dealing with the most diabolical political elite, these, um, these mafias. I mean, they really ought to apologize to the real mafia. You know, the Bananos and the Gambinos have just re- been replaced with Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. And so, I mean, you have all these – these Kazarian mafias and the others like them, these competing interests. Folks, if you only knew the full extent, and I, I can't get into it right now, but this is there's a reason why we support things like what they're doing at Mountain Readiness to raise money for Caleb House and also Kentucky Sustainable Living, where they're raising money with a VIP dinner for Vets for Child Rescue. There's a reason we support them, y'all. You don't know the full extent of what's going on in this world. A lot of it, and you're never. Remember what I told you about the people in the press? how they don't have a plan B and how they're also being replaced by AI. Yeah. Nobody's talking about that. So all the ones that do have jobs, believe me, they are the flying monkeys of the power elite. So they're never going to talk about this stuff. But yeah, 1700 kids still MIA and that ain't newsworthy. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. So it was either a snatch job or a murder job who even knows, but I'm not. And then there's been some of this stuff out there that, you know, Maybe it was China that did it. I have a hard time believing that because could China get the police to stand down? Could China get the the uh, firefighters to stand down? What about the local officials? I mean, this that goes, just seems like an easy scapegoat. It's yeah. just to blame it on China or blame it on Russia or whatever, whatever other country. That just seems like an easy scapegoat. Also, Hawaii seems to be an indicator of us about to go to war, <laughs> like attacks on Hawaii. So well, false flags on Hawaii. Never well, mind. ain't My the first bad. time. Yeah. Ain't the first time. All right, so let's get into some of this good news. All right, check this out. This lunatic New Mexico governor basically banned firearms, right? Yeah. (laughs) So she's saying, like, yeah, you know what? Second Amendment doesn't exist here. Well, not only does the attorney general say, nah, don't think I'm going to enforce that. Also, sheriffs, they're like, nope, we're calling it unconstitutional. We're not going to do it, Um, you know. Who's going to go patrol those deserts to make sure everybody has their guns turned in? <laughs> I'm, I, it is, I think it's literally trying to stoke a civil war. Yeah. I think I we're think at so. that point right now. And this is exactly why we started off with nine 11 y'all. That's exactly what this whole thing is. This is the strategy of tension. 
It's a death by a thousand cuts. It's no different than what unfolded in Rome. All right. So good news. We were in the good news. All right. So this just came out. And now a recent Lancet Lancet study basically admitted asymptomary, asymptom, a symptomless carrier claim was fiction. Unless a person shows symptoms, COVID transmission rarely occurs. Well, that's from the Lancet. And now all the prostitutes, you know, nobody's got anything to say about all that, which is the polar opposite of everything that little troll Fauci and all his ilk, what they were talking about. So it's the polar opposite of all that. So it makes you wonder why they're releasing this information like right before they're about to bring out the next wave. Well, isn't that what you talked about the last two weeks? Karmic debt. But it doesn't seem like they need to release this much information. I think they you know, know what I mean. I think it's already covered by the amount of information they've already released. I'll put it this way. I was just okay, listen to Dr. Oh my goodness, who is that guy? He's a cardiac cert, cardio, cardiologist. Peter McCullough? M- Peter Mc Yeah, that's him. He was in a recent interview not long ago saying that basically medical personnel who bought into this whole thing um even now they have dealt even though they Many of them are jabbed up the whole nine yards, even though they openly, they now know the information is out there that this whole thing was one big lie that they can't get themselves to admit. In fact, I was just on the phone moments before broadcasting with another medical professional, I won't say who, who was basically telling me in the hospital where this person works that every single person there is jabbed, nurses, doctors, and they're already all sick. And this person is saying, man, I wonder, I don't know what's about to happen. This person is the only one, I think, on the medical staff that isn't jabbed. And they're like, dude, everybody in here is like sick to no end. And we haven't even hit the fall yet. You know what? The the people that I know of just, you know, around town that have been jabbed so far have been sick recently. Yeah, well, there's a lot going on there. But that's what, this is what's. What Peter McCullough was saying, and what this person was saying too, is that the evidence is out there, but they will not look at it. It is overwhelming what's out there, and they will not look at it. And then Peter McCullough went on to say, and a a number of other doctors as well, is that they've come up with reasonable ways to keep whatever that was in that crap to keep it at bay. They now have sensible things. In fact, hey, y'all, here's a big one out there. I didn't even know. This just came out the other day. That a three-day fast. I'm going to give a shout-out to um, James and Eric. Uh, Eric Sider, that is, who first turned me on to my information about fasting. Um, people have realized that, man, there was a doctor just on the SGT report. And he's a Canadian doctor. And they found out that a 72-hour water fast has done unbelievable recovery to all these people that have been jabbed. That's awesome. So the people out there within the sound of my voice right now, you may not have gotten a memo on this, that apparently long-term fasts, three-day fasts, have done miracles as far as your body. Because when you hit autophagy, your body's saying, okay, we got to get rid of everything that is not useful in these cells. Guess what is kicking out? <laughs> the junk they jabbed in them. Good. And okay. that's what they're that's finding good. out. So, folks, that's big news there. That is enormous. So, if you've made the mistake of doing that, that, that might be something you want to consider. So, also, there's some other treatment options as well. But when I heard that one, man, I nearly forgot about that. Yeah. So, I'm glad I did finally get around to covering that. All right, with that said, y'all, we're going to go into my man, Eric. Hey, Eric Sider here with your Pimp Cast tip of the day. Today's tip, identifying burnout. Burnout is actually a recognized medical disorder. It is defined as a prolonged response to chronic emotional and interpersonal stressors on the job and is characterized by three dimensions of overwhelming exhaustion, cynicism and detachment, and a sense of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Much like symptoms of depression, burnout will asphyxiate your ambition, idealism, and sense of worth, and the onset and effects can be subtle. Very much like the frog in boiling water analogy, you don't notice it until it's too late. Burnout actually alters your neural circuitry and makes you more susceptible to negative thoughts and emotions. And there are six triggers of burnout. One, lack of control. Two, values conflict. Three, 
insufficient reward, 4. Work overload, 5. Unfairness, 6. Breakdown in community. And you must know the cause to solve the burnout problem. You can actually identify which triggers you are more susceptible to by taking the Maslach Burnout Inventory, which you can find online. You can find me on YouTube and Instagram at Eric Sider if you're in need of permaculture t-shirts or remote permaculture consultation and design, head over to ericsider.com. That's my dog right there. Eric Sider, go check him out, y'all. Um, every time he says remote, I keep expecting him to say, what do you think I'm thinking? Viewing? Yeah. yeah. Every time he says remote, <laughs> and when he says remote, I'm expecting what Eric's a remote viewer now. I mean, I, man, I've listened to too many weird podcasts, y'all. But no, he's right. You know, Eric was really the one... It's funny that he brings this up because I remember when I was working seven days a week, um, you know, uh, 12 hour days, it was Eric, honestly, that woke me up to people care starting with yourself. I never, ever had given that a second thought. And when he said it to me, it was just in a matter hold of on, fact hold kind on, of way. Hold on. He wasn't the first one to tell you. He's just the first one that listen, you listened to. Well, this was this. Well, I was still actually working on my tools at that time. I yeah, I know. We had, I had told you the same thing. Dad, and mom had told you the same thing. You just listened to Eric. Well, sometimes that's what it takes. I mean, it takes, you know, in the mouth of a couple other witnesses and stuff. But, you know, he was actually the one that made me give some serious thought about that. But I will say this I work harder now than I ever have on any job I ever have in my life. I get up earlier, I go to bed later. And I'm literally working from dawn till dusk. I don't have too much. I don't have any spare time minus that 20 minutes it takes for me to go to bed. And then at that time I'm doing what most people would find drudgery and I'm studying Yeah. that, you know, 20 or 30 minutes before I actually fall asleep. So I'm actually studying, but to me, that's very, that's stimulating. I mean, that's something I enjoy, but I don't even come close to feeling like I have burnout. Well, I do take one day off a week now, but I don't feel, I don't feel, I love everything I'm doing. So I, I guess what somebody said once, you know, what, what looks like work to other people feels like fun to me. So when I'm out there doing things that other people might find drudgery, you know, that's, you know, that's really not work to me. But, you know, when I'm out there playing hide and seek for three grand a week, working for somebody, yeah, I'm out there. You know, as soon as you show up, you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to get the break. As soon as you get the break, oh, I can't wait to get to lunch. Oh, can't wait to get the second break. Can't wait for this day to get done where you're literally, that leads to burnout. But also another little side note on burnout, a friend of mine, um, friend of mine asked Joel Salatin once, how do you deal with burnout? And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. He might even be listening now. And Joel told him that maybe your dreams ain't big enough. If I remember right, I think that's what the, um, I think that's what Joel's response was that maybe your dreams just aren't big enough. And I can relate to that part of it because honestly, when I wasn't living my dream, despite the fact that I am working my butt off. Yeah. Um, I felt burnout. Now, when I was in there working, I knew unlike the other guys I worked with at the time, I knew that when I was working on my tools and doing everything else that everybody else was doing, I tried to get every ounce of overtime I could because I knew it was getting me to a finish line that we'd worked on as a family for some time. So for me, I would work. I'm like, okay, I'm going to bust it. I'm going to work as many hours as I possibly can with a full expectation, with a full expectation that I am going to leave this onto something else that I want to do. So yeah, there is that uh, deal with burnout. So before we get into it, y'all remember EMP shield 50 bucks off with promo code PERMA. Do I even need to go into it? Look, I'm put, I got one on every vehicle, but I will say this. I'm not trying to go to the club. If something jumps off, I just need to get back to the hizzle. Faux shizzle. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't think I'm, they do know what you're saying, Dad. Well, I didn't know. I don't even know what that means, but <laughs> he wants get, to get back to the house. Thank you for the translation, <laughs> my son. Yeah, that's exactly it. I just need to get back to the house. And then also your biggest threat is lightning. Yeah, it helps that it will shunt this stuff to ground. But honestly, your biggest threat is lightning. And that's why I promote EMP shield, because you know what? 25,000 guarantee if that thing gets past and Kentucky fries anything in your house. So that's why I'm all about EMP Shield. 
All right. Main topic, y'all. And it all goes, it, this is a show that definitely has continuity from the beginning because, okay, having lived through September 11th and all the other nonsense that has happened from that time until now, which, by the way, I tried to chronicle to some extent in a YouTube video that just got flagged, right? Yep, it got flagged. And uh, they haven't well, they really told us why. It. Well, they limited, it's limited monetization, meaning it can only show it to a limited amount of people. Um, I don't, I really don't even know why they didn't say why. And even in the video, we didn't show any pictures that would have made it. Get they put flagged. a caption. They put a caption on the bottom of it. They and did. It had something to do with climate change, which I don't even know what they're talking about. If I remember right, I just glanced oh, at it. No, it had to do with the title. Cause it was talking about, cause the, uh, the liberals claim that Katrina happened due to climate change, which it did just not in the way that they're saying it did. So it's part of the title that even mentions climate change. Oh, I see the climate changed as soon as some full at heart pulled the right button. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The climate changed whenever it starts ah, to stand still. I see. Yeah. yeah. When hurricanes just don't move. Yeah. Right. <laughs> huh? Wow. Happened. So in I, tried to also. Use, I tried to use safe wording. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's wording that they use. All right. So we'll have to change that up when we get a chance and play some semantics that maybe they'll play along with. But, you know, really, this is one of those days, September 11th, that really ought to give us all pause in terms of our own preparedness. So, in a nutshell, y'all, this is going to sound like common sense, but I'm going to say it. Prepare for everything. Now, gratuitous plug, right back to EMP. Son, ever since you were little, is ever since I was involved, as early as probably you can remember, in the preparedness movement. What did our family always prepare for? EMP. And why? Because if you're it, prepared for an EMP, you're prepared for everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's like when you hear somebody say, well, I'm preparing for this or I'm preparing. Look, I'm going to prepare for the worst case scenario. Is it likely to happen? I don't know. But if it does, if I'm prepared for the worst one, well, then if anything less than that comes along, then you know what? No big thing. I've already been there. Yeah. To a certain extent or another. So... This is why I'm saying prepare for everything. So what does that mean? Remember earlier in the show, I talked about propagating blueberries. Well, there's a reason I'm doing that. Number one, save a pile of money. Two, I could probably gift some away if they turn out, which I suspect they will. Um, also, it's passive food production. And I don't know why there's so many homesteaders I can't seem to get to understand this. Yeah, a lot of homesteaders don't want to get into the tree aspect. Or they, if they do, it's like one or two that came with the property or just one or two that they planted. I don't understand it. When you got things like apples, if you pick the right cultivar of apple, you know, there's that uh, Old Southern Apples book by Lee Calhoun. And it's it's kind of a keepsake now. It's pretty hard to find. I mean, if you can find it, that book's probably 300 bucks right now. And he goes through and he explains that when there were slaves in the South, one thing they would do was take these apple varieties that dried very well, that they could eat all year long, and they would dry them on the tin roofs. Yeah. And that's how they did it. And then they would have something to eat all year long. Well, take that, overlay it with where we are right now. Now let's do, so, let's do it just a little bit of thinking here. You got passive food production in terms of berries, in terms of trees. But so many homesteaders just overlook those things. I never for the life of me could understand why. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you just, I mean, it, you literally just plant it and then wait for it to produce fruit. And then you keep harvesting the fruit. You don't have to worry about the maintenance you do with annual crops or anything like that. You don't have to worry about replanting it over and over and over again. Okay. So the worst you got to deal with, if that's the model you, you choose is okay. You got to prune. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you make a food. Well, yeah, that's it. what I was thinking is that you don't even have to prune. I mean, your maintenance could be non-existent completely and you just harvest from it after you plant it. Raspberries, blueberries. I mean, we got a whole nother crop of strawberries coming in. Yeah. That'll blow your doggone mind. And these are all set it and for, well, I hate, man, I hate to say it this way, but it's, it's not really a set it and forget it kind of thing because it does require your attention to some extent or another. But this, these are the gifts that keep on giving. Now, in terms of that preparedness, 
you know, I was very critical about the people out there after 9-11 and after this whole COVID debacle went right back into vac- vacation mode. Yeah. Busted. The brokest people I know constantly on vacation right now got no beans put back, no berries, no bullets, no nothing. And this is exactly what they ought to be doing. And I'm talking to people that have not a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out, but they're on constant vacation. Look, rice is up five bucks from what it was, I think, a month and a half, maybe two months ago. Five bucks. And it's still a bargain. Yeah. It's still a bargain. For a 50-pound bag of rice where we live right now, I think last time, I, I don't know, may have been approaching 25 bucks. It's still a bargain. It really is. Are you putting any of this stuff back? Because, folks, I got news for you. Every single metric you look at, and I'm, I'm talking without question. The food production, what's happening to all the crops out there? Do I need to tell you? The war scenario. We are literally picking a fight with Russia. You know, they got supersonic or hypersonic missiles. But I think Russia also is aware of the fact that this is September 11th. And guess what we have? (laughs) Space-based weapons. And we ain't afraid to murder our own people. Well, I think they probably have it too, don't you think? Well, yeah, actually they do because they were melting that path up in the... uh up north and this was uh was it about when we were moving here or maybe the winter before that yeah we're talking yeah yeah, directed energy weapons they got them it's suspected that china has them which also means free energy um that's a no that's a story unto itself but if anybody isn't believing that that's a legit story that they all confirmed and they all came out with openly that russia was using these directed energy weapons to melt paths through the ice through the ice yeah So there it is. I mean, it's right there in your face. And they even asked permission first, and everybody said no, and they did it anyway, which was part of the story. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, these hypersonic missiles are all well and good, but I'm saying we have a government right now. We have an economic system that is on the brink of collapse, and still nobody's preparing. Every single metric that you can think of right now is unfolding. I'm not saying this to scare anybody, y'all. I am just trying. Yeah, I guess to a certain extent I am. I'll just be perfectly frank and honest about it. It's a day like today where the powers that shouldn't be murdered a bunch of people. And this happened a bunch of times on this day through history. Yeah. A lot of things have happened on September 11th through history. This is the first September 11th that's happened where it didn't seem like everybody was thinking about it. What do you mean? Have you noticed that? Like every other time... Like every other September 11th since then, um, like you would go out in public and everybody kind of, it seemed like it was on everybody's mind at least. Like nobody really behaved, I guess, the same way. Everybody was kind of gloomy or something like that. Today, it didn't seem that way. This seemed like the first September 11th where nobody was um, like somber. Yeah. And that's exactly what I'm getting at is we always forget. Every time some tragedy happens, we will never forget. Well, there's a reason Gore Vidal called us the United States of Amnesia, because we do forget. Nobody cares to know the history. The teachers aren't teaching it. I mean, you know, we're worried about gender studies instead of of teaching the real history as to why these things happen. And then the parents at the house, you know, they're so wore out from going to work and doing what they're doing. They're not necessarily bringing any of this information home and have or have the bandwidth at the end of working all day, just trying to put bread on the table when their dollars are worth even less to even confront or any reteach of the stuff. their kids. Right. They don't necessarily have it the way you did where you were hearing no matter what was going on, you were trained from the earliest to say, Hey, is this true? Do I believe it? Not everybody has that bandwidth, but the point being folks, I know all of us are struggling to some extent or another. And I mean, all of us, Believe me, we ain't the Rockefellers either. We're feeling the pinch just like everybody else. Got the same issues just like everybody else. The difference is, you know, concerning some people, is that we've been in preparedness mode for two decades now. And, yeah, does it give you a tactical advantage? Yeah, to some extent. But every single marker is unfolding. What are you doing about it? Are you like the other folks out there that have forgotten? If you're listening to this pimp cast, you probably aren't. But there are no shortage, there is no shortage of everybody out there 
that is as business as usual in the apocalypse, as Clyde Lewis says. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's as business as usual in the apocalypse. And I'm not saying that's, you know, apocalypse obviously means revealing or unfolding, but I'm not saying we're, we're to that just yet. But everybody has got to start. Think about your water situation. Think about everything. If you didn't learn anything out of September 11th or Oklahoma City or any of the other things that have unfolded, I mean, it could be a freak snowstorm or a tornado. Or a not-so-freak snowstorm or a not-so-freak tornado. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, these things are happening, it seems, more frequently. Like, the more devastating one seems to be happening more frequently with more direction. Let me so. tell you who else you need to stockpile for. And I'm, I'm, I know a lot of people don't think about this. If you got pets, you might want to think about putting something back for them. We do. Um, also, your animals. Like I said, I got enough forage to get us through the winter that's put back, that's growing right now. It's stockpiled for the winter. And we have enough hay if we had nothing at all to feed them. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. I don't know what scams. I don't know what else ever else they may pull. I have no idea. So I'm ready for bear, even with my animals. Now that's one of the things I think a lot of people don't put back for. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people are concerned about that. Cause uh, I think a lot of people just assume, Oh, they're animals. They'll fend for themselves at those times. Well, not if they're a hundred percent domesticated animals, like your cat or your dog or your whatever it may be. I'm going to tell you all straight. I mean, my wife, she's never said this to me before, but I tend to think, you know, that beginning line of Richard III in Shakespeare's Richard III, now is the winner of our discontent. Man, she's had this really, really strange feeling, and she's never done that before. In all the years we've been married, almost 30 years, she's never said this to me. She's like, I feel the need to get prepared, and she's not listening to gloom and doom podcasts all day, nothing like that. She's just had this feeling in her gut and I followed it. I mean, I was already following it anyway, but to kick it up even more because folks, I don't, there's an election that they don't want to happen or maybe they do, or maybe they want to make it look like they don't. Who even knows what scams and schemes these clowns are up to at the end of the day, you got a dollar that is on its way out. Look at the BRICS nations for crying out loud. Yeah. All these countries signing on. Well, you know what that does to us? Maybe not now, but soon it's going to drop that dollar. And what's the best way to put things back together? War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Hey, Jeff Keith Snow with your pimp cast tip of the day. We're going to talk today about proper knife care. Now, good chef's knives and culinary knives are quite expensive, and it makes sense to maintain them. Here's a few things you'd never want to do. Number one, never want to toss your knife into the sink with other plates or other culinary tools. Never, ever, ever. Also, do not let them go into the dishwasher. And then never toss them into a drawer with other knives or other cooking tools. That is not the proper way to store expensive knives. Now, assuming you keep these things nice and sharp, that's the first step. The second step is after you use it, you want to quickly wash it with hot soapy water. And I wash the entire length of the blade, both sides, including the handle, rinse it under running water, and then I take a clean kitchen towel, dry it, and it goes immediately back into a block or into a drawer storage system that's speci uh, specifically made to hold knives in place. Um, please don't toss them uh, into a drawer with other knives or into the sink. That is not good. If you do these things, your knives will last you an awfully long time. This is a great investment. A good, sharp knife is a safe knife. Knives that are dull will cut you much more quickly than a sharp knife. I do really advise folks to spend a little money and get a good knife. It will improve your experience in the kitchen, guaranteed. With that, I wanted to encourage you all to check out HarvestEating.com. You'll find my brown duck coffee for sale there my podcast and all the other content that I've put out through the years. And also want to encourage you to subscribe to Food Storage Feast. $2.99 a month gets you over 50 videos and counting 
still shooting videos to put on that site, and it teaches you how to cook with simple stored foods. Take care, everyone. Okay. Yeah, were you listening, Dad? Yeah, totally. Yeah, you and Mom. Dad oh, is about to no. go. Dad oh, is about no. to go on a uh-huh. rant about how Mom just destroys all the knives around here. Well, I got news for you. I'm the only one that takes care of knives around here. Your mom, will mom, scrape and that Dad destroy knives. Negative, negative. Your Both mom's sitting them. there raking that knife off. She's scraping stuff off the cutting board. I'm like Chef Snow. Okay, hey, I'm going to make your actually, mom's listening to this program. Actually, hold on. I've already, I've already solved this. I bought mom a knife for her, I think it was for Christmas or her birthday last year. I bought her a knife. No, no, no. It was uh, Mother's Day this year. I bought her a knife, a special knife, one that only she can use. She's the only one allowed to use it. I've only had to hone that knife. She's she's hardly ever used that. I got she news for you. She uses it all the time. No, no, she doesn't. <laughs> yes, she She'll does. use it for certain things. I'm telling you what, dude. She could break a ball bearing. I ain't ever I, seen nothing I like agree, it. I agree, but y'all are both horrible on no, knives. No, no, man. I know how. I know Dad, how to. I'm the one that sharpens all the butcher look, knives. Yeah, I know how You're to use a knife. Scraping bone. Okay, that's different, dude. During <laughs> I got to get the meat off the bone if I'm doing butchery work. But I'm saying when it comes to a chef's knife. I'm telling Chef Snow, you need to come to the rescue, bro. Show this woman how to use a dog. She'll no. be sitting there right after you sharpen it. She's taking the blade, scraping the stuff off the cutting board. I'm like, Michelle, turn the knife upside down. What are you doing? <laughs> okay, I will say one thing that mom is guilty of that dad isn't guilty of is just throwing knives in the sink. You don't know what's under those under those suds. I'm, dude, I ain't ever seen nothing like it, dude. Yeah. I know a lot of guys out there saying amen. So, hey, ladies, I'm sorry. If the shoe fits, wear it. If it's too tight, take it off. But I know. <laughs> look, I, Hey, by the way, his brown duck coffee, um, we had some of that. He sent me some before. Your mom just ordered some, I think, a few days ago. That coffee from Chef Snow, y'all, you want to go check it out. It is off the meat wagon. That stuff was really, really awesome coffee. That's a good thing if you didn't know. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a bean, but it's I'm I'm serious, man. Yeah. Your mom made some of that coffee, and we're like, whoa! And then I don't, I don't know if I tried it. I don't know if I had any. Yeah, she was probably hoarding it from you. But the problem here's the problem: we drank all that up, and okay, so we started going back to that substandard. We're trying to use up the other stuff that was already in the cabinet. Yeah, and it was like, man, it, it's like this: when you taste really, really awesome food. It is really tough to go back to eating awful food. Yeah. And that's what we kind of did with this coffee. So we drank his coffee and then turned back around and then drank up this other stuff. And she was like, okay, we'll just buy more when we run out. And then somehow or another got lost in the shuffle. Look, y'all. I mean, there's a reason why he is Chef Snow. My man knows what time it is. And that coffee is off the hook. Um, We get no, like I said, we're not... We buy the coffee ourselves, so go check them out. You'll be glad you did. That, that coffee's excellent. Ready for Q and A? Yeah, got one on the Fountain app from D. Aaron's, I think. Uh, I just had a waitress at a restaurant tip herself twenty percent to do her self entitlement uh, due to her self entitlement. What? <laughs> she brought me the bill, and I almost left her a twenty dollars cash tip until I looked at the bill a second time and realized that she what she had done. She tipped herself around fourteen dollars on my card. She got a smaller tip and a negative Google review out of her entitlement. Do you have any recommendations for buying property out of state, not knowing the history of the land? Hashtag tip a pimp. Hashtag end entitled purple breathers. I'll be honest with you, man. Um, I've almost made that mistake uh, three or four times in the past where I was going to buy land sight unseen, and it was all in Colorado. It's a good thing I didn't because I would have been, first of all, there's already water issues anyway. They claimed that all these parcels had artesian wells. Well, yeah, better in the brochure. I don't know if it's sight unseen or just not knowing the history of the land. I would definitely not buy land if you've never been there. I would definitely do a serious once over or have a proxy that you really trust to do it for you. Yeah, exactly. But I wouldn't, especially these days, I can't even tell you, um, like trying to find a vehicle and William does the research on this stuff because we got really, really old vehicles and we don't ever get rid of them until they just kind of give in. And we got some giving in like simultaneously. So we're out here looking for vehicles and then you find out, Good night, man. There's a whole lot of 
shady people out there. If they'll do that with vehicles, there ain't no telling what might have been there before you. Okay, so Jody says, um, yeah, yeah, she's also from Oklahoma, and uh, she lives in a rural town there, and it, she's interested in permaculture. She says we crack her up. Um, she was also wondering, I don't know if I got this one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the catchphrase we use. I'm sorry, this computer started acting up. And uh, she was wondering what tip a pimp meant. <laughs> okay, well, um, I explained it to her, but I, I, obviously other people are going to have that question as well. Well, we're not really pimps. Um, we are when you say permaculture is my passion, but it's really, if you want to donate money on the Fountain app or you want to check us out on Patreon, yeah, you can you can do it that way. And, um, you know, that's kind of a funny way of us saying it. I don't even know where that, to be honest with you, I don't even know where it came from. I think I just did it out of... Just off the top of my head at one of our earliest programs. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not really sure where it came up. Uh, was it something with Jack Spierko? No, no. it might have been. It might have been. I don't really know. But it, it ended up being like a funny way of doing it. So we just kind of kept with it because, you know, shows a lot of farm shows tend not to have a whole lot of comedic elements in it. And we try from time to time to put that in there. Well, on the heels of that, Jen and Indy says, thanks for the natural deworming recipe. Hashtag tip a pimp. Bam. I guess everybody's on that with tip a P I M P permaculture is my passion. So Matthew says I'm currently, well, okay. Well, anyway, check this out. Um, in a nutshell, there's a orchard over there, and it's not far from Asheville. He called it At La Pass. He says, check it out when you get a chance. So we certainly will. Yeah. Uh, got one from Laurel Anderson on the YouTube channel. Uh, Permaculture Pimp Cast, if you didn't know, we're on the YouTube channel. Um, okay, I see what y'all are saying. Just to clarify, I agree that the crucible of hard times is the only way out at this point. Our punishment from the Lord is happening. At the same time, I kind of feel like we are called to do something on our end, like preparing to vote for the best option given. Will it matter? No. Yeah, I can definitely understand. As far that. as the voting goes, like yeah. whether or not. Yeah, I, I would think that the point is to get to the point where the vote doesn't matter. Well, let me say it this way. Maybe, okay, so you render a vote on a national or even this, you know, let's say it's a national election. Okay. But maybe you put your concentration in your local family and your communities and building up that way. And really, just like we just saw, like we cited in that article from New Mexico, where the governor comes out with this decree, you know, <laughs> which is absolutely laughable, but comes out with this decree and what happened? the local government, the county sheriff, and that's why you want to know who your sheriff is and what they do and where they stand. The sheriff said, yeah, um, not going to work with that. That's where it's mo that's why it's most important. It is your highest elected official is that county sheriff. That's why you want to know them. Maybe you want to get to know them well and why you might also consider, are they even good people? Because a lot of these people aren't. Some of them are. I know a sheriff. He's been an Army buddy of mine. He's a good friend, and he's up in Nebraska. And some of these people might be absolute polecats. So, yeah, maybe render a vote on a national election, but don't count on it being where you put most of your focus. Keep your focus in your community. Yeah. All right. So, okay, Alexis is asking, I, re I received fig, cutting, fig cuttings from my sister-in-law in Maryland about four weeks ago. Basically, she put them in water and they've been sitting in the window. Well, that may be, and she's saying nothing's happening. So what you want to try to do is, well, what we do and what we've done is like 60% potting soil, a little bit of coconut core, and then we put compost on top. We don't mix our compost in. So it'll be something like a slow-release fertilizer, and that's what we do. I'd take them out of the cutting or take them out of the water and just, you know, pot them straight up. Um, yeah. that, that's a good way of going about it. There's a bunch of different – that's in one of those things. Like you're going to find 10,000 different techniques to do the same thing, but that's yeah. one that we know works. Got one from Mirlin. He says, uh, new singles ad, H-H-I-S-O-P-P, -P, which is Homestead Honey in Search of Permaculture Prints. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, are they, where are they posting well, no, this no, no, ad? I think they were just saying it was, uh, I, I don't think it was an actual post. I think it's a, <laughs> I think they were saying like, hey, use oh, this as a template. I thought they were going on one of these things saying, oh, okay. Or maybe they are. I don't know. I got one from Laurel Anderson. She's saying, 
LOL. Amen to the being a pimp before looking for your homestead honey. Uh, coming from an aspiring homestead honey, working on the homestead, no honey yet. Ha ha. Yeah, that's, you know, they're out there. They really are because as many permaculture princes that are looking for a homestead honey, it's the same thing is happening on the other end. It's, you're going to have to get out there, folks. You're going to have to talk through, and you may have to kiss a couple of frogs. I don't mean literally. Um, Go to festivals. Go to the homestead festival. Believe it or not, that is a really good place. Man, maybe we could host a singles thing for somebody out there, you know, for homestead singles that are looking to find well, it somebody. Well, should be pretty obvious. It's the one not carrying around three or four kids. Well, <laughs> it's a homesteading event. Believe it or not, I have come across them there where there's, you know, there's guys that are stag and there's women that are stag there. So go up and say hi, you know. They'll be probably shocked that anybody said hi to anybody else these days. Well, I'm not at those things. It's usually usually a really awesome crowd. Yeah. So I'm getting a lot of um, comments regarding the book that came out or comments that are resulting in that. So Gabby Hundley, uh, Matt Hundley's wife, who co-wrote the book, um, you know, she's been forwarding some of these questions, and so I'll try to get to some of them. Has there been any research or experiments done with replacing commercial agriculture with permaculture? Um, okay. Yeah, there actually has, I don't know if they've been official. I don't know if they've been done on a university level. What we do find out is that when they do conduct a lot of these kinds of things, they're not comparing apples with apples. Yeah. They don't exactly, they they'll say, well, it doesn't work, but guess what? You didn't follow the recipe either, or you did half of it. That's why they say a lot of this stuff doesn't overlay is because they're doing a lot of these universities are doing these experiments at the behest of people that want a certain outcome. Well, you're also, in some instances, taking very, very high-functioning systems and trying to force it into a sick system. There you go. So that that's part of the reason why it doesn't Without work. Without accounting for, for transfer. Exactly. You're, yeah. you're basically taking a, a chemical-heavy crop, and to make that transition from that, to what you need is not an overnight thing. So if it doesn't, Dr. Elaine Ingham even talks about it a lot in her thing where these, these experiments go off the way, the exact way that the people who are funding that experiment want it to. And these universities are basically, they're a bunch of polecats. So yeah. Do you think they're paying hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of dollars to get an answer that they don't want? Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, got one from Jerry K from the YouTube channel. Hey, Billy and William enjoyed and appreciate your show. We have started using ground up black walnut hulls in the drinking water for our animals, uh, goats, chickens, guineas, uh, pigs, and guardian dogs. Free choice. Also have read that you can put whole black walnuts in a bucket and fill it with water and it works just as well. Uh, thanks for your willingness to share what y'all have learned. The old Texas coot, Jerry. Yeah, there's, um, a lot of cool stuff you can do with black walnut. Yeah, um, you want to go ahead and tell them about that. <laughs> I think I talked. I think I talked about it before, where you could take oh, the yeah. you can take the husks. I did this little experiment one time and um, put it in an onion sack, threw it out in this pond with a rope tied to it, and it'll. I thought it killed those fish, but apparently they're stunned. Man, you talk about getting diddy mouth out of that place, man. I'm thinking, dude, the law is coming for me, man. So I jumped in that service truck and got out. I did it on a lunch break. This is years ago. Um, other people have done the same exact thing for when they wanted to get worms for fishing, put a bunch of black walnut husks. Now this is highly illegal y'all. So don't do this and get caught. Okay. Don't do this <laughs> and get caught. Yeah. But don't do it. But I understand if you did. Okay. So, so, um, yeah, you can do the same thing, pour it on the ground and then worms will come jumping up out of the ground. Like, I mean, it'll freak you out when you see it unfold. Um, right here, we got one. Here's a good question. Um, like I said, there's so many people getting in this space. So we're getting a lot of people that are asking stuff right off the bat. So when first starting permaculture, what is the first thing to start with? Uh, didn't catch the name on this, but the last name Jackson. Um, and they're asking, is it shop, garden, animals, house, equipment? Well, Eric Sider has a shirt that kind of says it all. Right. Yeah. Water access structures. Yeah. And some will put it the other way around. I'm in the camp with Joel Salatin on this one. He actually wrote about it the other day in his blog where I put access first, then water, 
and structures. Now, some are going to see it a different way because I'm like... I can see both ways me because too, me too. In, in some environments and some terrains, your water is going to dictate your access. Like on Jeff Lawton's farm, his access is on top of dam walls and stuff like that. So if you figure out your water, you're kind of also at the same time figuring out good access because you're figuring out contour. You're figuring out where everything is going to go. And then sometimes your damn walls can access as bridges. I can see it both way. I'm not, I'm, I mean, it would all depend. And that's the answer nobody ever wants to hear. Yeah. But it's true. But I tend to lean toward the access first, just with how my mind works. But if somebody said, hey, I'm putting water first, well, I guarantee access, like William said, is already kind of implied into it. I guess it would depend on how quickly they have to be on the property or like how much time and how much money they have to put into the property because obviously you want to get to the you know you want to get to the point where you're living on the property quickly as well so there might be that as aspect as well uh got one is my turn got one from soul shine farm uh i listened to this on the apple podcast today while i was canning salsa and pickled jalapenos y'all are legit my favorite podcast and youtube channel i got to meet and talk with you and michelle at the keeper of the old ways festival in dothan alabama I was uh, I was the one from Atlanta. Y'all keep doing what you're doing. You're a blessing, Emily. Well, you're a blessing too, Emily. And it was a joy to be at that festival. It was a really, really fun place. Really neat. Really, really neat location for it. And it was at a time of year, really, where it it was kind of cool to be in a in a warmer environment. So, yeah, that was a really awesome thing. And I, I'm pretty sure they're going to have another festival coming up. I look forward to going back down there. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um this one here from Leo from Ochili Farm. I think I, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. And he's Cusetta, Georgia. O, Ochile or Ochile. I'm not sure how you do it. He says, hi there. Um, in your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges in developing your permaculture homestead and how have you overcome them? The work is easy. Eric Sider, I think, has said exactly the same thing. The work is easy. It's the human interaction, the people part of the things that make it difficult. In fact, Jeff Lawton has said it. Oh yeah. And yeah. it's not at all the work. It's not the design. It's not any of that. It's not nature. <laughs> no, that's the easiest thing to do. It's the people issues. I remember Eric and I, I'd let Eric tell this story, but him being involved. In fact, when I was talking about doing this college thing with your mom, like looking for property over there, it was like, um, man, do I want to reach out to some people to, to get me in contact with the people I need over there. And then I was like, oh, I don't know, man, if I got to go through this consensus model that Eric had to go through on one of his projects, mm -hmm. dude, I swear I'll, I'm going to strangle somebody. Take an order for, from some master gardener. <laughs> yeah. Taking orders from somebody who does not at all understand what it is we're trying to do or be forced into a collaboration, which I will not do unless it's somebody that I know very well I'm not going to get myself forced into a collaboration where you wind up in a position where you're having to come up with these, you're having to compromise on certain things. And that's just not what I do. I'm not going to share. I mean, if you come from two entirely different backgrounds on this, it makes no sense to even team up to work on the project. So, okay. Yeah. Back to your question though. Biggest challenge really is the people. If you're, if you're going to do a homestead and you're forming up with other homesteads or dangerously enough, family, you better really have your ducks in a row and you better not be, especially when we're talking about preparedness in this episode, make absolutely sure these are people that are working on the front end. Because if you're waiting for something to jump off and then they show up at your place, you are going to be disappointed in the most profound way. Um, people are the problem. And that can be a good thing. It's just I haven't seen too many examples of that being a good thing. Got one from Mrs. H. Uh, amen. Hey, here's a thought on the days that Pastor Lon is not able to give a word. How about you give one of your favorite Bible verses? Thank you for, or thank you for your, thank you for you and your family. Uh, God bless y'all. You know, hey, speaking of Pastor Lon, yeah, he's on vacation right now, so I didn't want to trouble him to, uh, you know, do a thing for the show today. I wanted him to go ahead and chill out. I mean, good night, man. That, that man works so hard. It's unbelievable. If anybody deserves a break. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. As far as my favorite Bible verse, I don't, you know, I've been asked that before. I don't know that I have one per se, but I'm a big fan 
of so many of the Psalms. Like right now, I'm memorizing another one, but I mean, there's so many things that just speak to me. And I think of somebody like King David. I mean, this dude was a king, done extraordinary things, and you see how he humbles himself before the Almighty. To me, that's just so incredibly inspiring in the Psalms. There's so many things in there. Um, he will, he shall bear thee up in their, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. When I, when I say that, I say it every single day, y'all, or another Psalms or, an, or one that I'm memorizing at the, current, at, at the present moment. It brings me joy. It brings me peace. And it's usually something out of the psalm. I, I don't know why that speaks to me so much. There's so much. Yeah, it's usually going to be something like when we were putting out the fence today, I was reciting Psalm mm-hmm. 2. And, um, you know, I do that all the time. It, it brings me peace. It brings me joy. So uh, Raul, he, um, you know, he was on the Firmamental podcast. Cool name for a podcast. I'll be straight up. Yeah, he says... Um, and, and I, I that's the episode that's coming out this Thursday. Yeah, that's what's coming out this Thursday, and it was a it was a real joy to hang out with those guys. It's going to be off the beaten path, y'all, and I encourage everybody to check it out. It's going to be some of that stuff that should make you think. You may not agree with everything, but you'll be glad you did. But Raul, man, he's like we're one of his favorite podcasts now. Oh, and, that's cool. You know, I really dig their stuff as well. Thanks, Raul. Yeah, and uh, he bought the book, and he's digging it. Man, it was. I can't wait to have those guys back on and talk about some other stuff because it seems like we only just touched the surface. But um, yeah, man, I'm really, really digging my man Raul, and um, got to be honest with y'all, that's one cool thing about doing this whole podcast thing is that it creates a letter level of being interactive with people that you just don't seem to get when you do a YouTube channel. Yeah, I would love to be able to do this live and be able to do some kind of call in thing where we could interact you know, straight up, do it like a, almost like a radio show. I know you could do that sort of thing on blog talk radio and some of these others, but I'm not quite sure how you do that here. And we're still working out some of the tech on this stuff. So that would be cool to be able to do it like a, a live call in radio show, but we'd have to figure out how to make that work. So maybe William can work that into all the other technical things that he's doing. <laughs> Thanks dad. Let me get this microscope figured out first. Yeah. Work on that. <laughs> Look y'all remember, it is September 11th. I'm not sure. You may be listening to this on the 12th or 13th. Who even knows? But listen, y'all, we do this show for a reason. And there, as of late, there has always, always, always been something of a preparedness theme in everything we do in the videos and everything we do on this podcast. That's why at the end of every podcast, we always say stay alert. Stay alive. <laughs>